Welcome to our cross-border conversation on mixing sound for film and TV. Thank you to Genelec for supporting this strand of talks and to Brunel University London for providing technical support. And now I'll hand over to our four speakers to introduce themselves, perhaps starting with Lisa. Hi, Lisa. Hiya, thank you, Rebecca. My name is Lisa and I am UK based. So that would be in the North London Harringay area. Most of you may be familiar with it, most of you might not. Um, and I specialize in sound design, but also I specialize in other areas such as music composition, sound, or sometimes dialogue, or sometimes a mixture of just composing tracks in my spare time. But I'm also open to networking with others and I've been doing a collection of um, collaborations, but we'll later down the line get on to introducing those later on down the line. My name is Alex Joaquim. I'm a composer based in New York City. Um, and yeah, I just, I love doing music. It's like, I'm always inspired by how like powerful music and sound can be in a film, especially um, the mixture of everything. So really excited to get into talking about mixing and all of that. And maybe Elise, if you want to. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Elise. Um, I'm originally from Detroit, but I'm now based in West London. I do mainly mainly sound design, sound engineering, with sort of a focus in dialogue and ADR. My name is Ricky. Um, I'm originally from China, and now I'm based in LA. Um, I'm now like a film composer, and I also work as an orchestrator for Nathan Wang, a Hollywood composer, and yeah. That's sort of my career right now. First off, so nice to be talking with you all. It's yeah. Such fun. Yeah, it's really nice getting to talk sound and music. Um, yeah, but I, I think just like as a kid, I'd be watching these films and I was always just like really drawn Hello. to the music and the sound and like Fine. what that could do, like the like okay. the addition of everything. And I was also like doing a lot of classical piano and um as i got more and more like versed in piano and composition um i was really interested i was like how can i tell really cool stories with this and as i started getting to know film music more i was like this is a really really cool medium mm. um especially just because like there are so many layers to it i always find them inspired i know i keep talking about layers i guess that's the the the, <laughs> the theme of today is like layers because it is such a layered thing it's like you're not just it's not just a piece for piano it's a piano piece used at a very specific time but the piano has a very specific sound it sounds you know really far away and it's like there's something really specific to it um that i'm that i'm drawn to i like what you say about layers because sometimes like with sound design i know I'll, you'll be working on just one minute of video and you'll be looking down at your keyboard looking at your sound library looking down and you look up and all of a sudden you've like 25 tracks stacked up and you're just thinking, how did I, how did I get here? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's perfect, right? My love of sound design started when I was in college. So I got really inspired by different types of composers, such as John Williams, for example, in terms of the music side of um, the film side. And also Hans Zimmer, who's also been an inspiration for me. As for the sound design, I got inspired by this guy called Mark Coven. He specializes in sort of sounds for horror. So he creates sort of his own personal sound. He even created this apprehension engine that creates this eerie like sound. So, you know, those kind of um, string like sounds you hear in horror films, yeah. so those type of screeches. I really was inspired by that. I wanted to create those type of sounds or any type of unusual sound. So, whenever I hear something unusual, I love to record it. <laughs> So I always have my field recorder on me just to record those type of sounds. It's really enjoyable and I love it to the bone. As for the music side, I've been passionate about the classical and also the pop side, but I also like to explore different genres. I don't like sticking to just one specific genre. I like to experiment. So when it came to music, I released my first ever album. That was in, I believe it was 2022. That was when I first released my album of different genres. Obviously, there's a link to that, but we can get into that later on. Um, at the moment, I've just been working on my next album that will be coming up this week. So be please be, look forward to that. <laughs> and I've also been trying to get more into sound design. So I've been trying, I'm at the moment doing an internship at the moment for sound design. So I'm trying to get 
more sounds collected together just to put onto a visual. And I just love how music and sound has the power just to create that type of emotion and invoke something in a person. That's the kind of thing I want to do for my music and sound. That's always been a goal of mine. I sort of always growing up, yeah, like my mom put me in piano lessons when I was six. And so it's just kind of always a part of my life and my everyday. And then when I got sort of uni age, similar to you, Lisa, you kind of have to you're presented with all the different avenues in film and you kind of gravitate towards one. And for me, that was sound. And I tried to do a bit of like onset sound recording. And then I realized I do not have the temperament to be on set all day. And then I found post-production sound. And I was like, this, this is sitting in front of a computer. This is really nice. It, sound and music just, yeah, it's such a big part of it. And it can really change like, especially being in uni, it's hard to, I find it's hard to find like material to practice. It's mm. hard to find stuff to practice on and to put on demo reels. So Absolutely. what I would do is find a lot of old movies, like thirties, forties have mm. such little sound design. So I'd go back and like redesign those films, whether that be enhancing the genre they already are, or seeing if I can play around with them to make them seem like a different genre and stuff like that. And yeah, I've just always been so interested in how sound can tell a story. Yeah. And you can always just do little tweaks just to keep it's it the to the original, things. But yeah, you know, sound design, I love it. You can just explore a bit and just change it slightly in terms of tonality yeah. and all of that. I have yeah. so much respect for you all with sound because I, I did like a really, really short spot. It was like 10 seconds and they wanted sound design and music. I'm like, I'll just do the sound design. <laughs> and it, it ended up well, but it was very just the details were like so mm. like like the footsteps. I always mm. hear footsteps are yeah. like notorious. <laughs> footsteps are the most um hardest, I will say that in terms of sound design, because you have to get oh, them yes. on point. You don't want them to sound yeah. too muddy or too airy. That's the thing. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, because it's it's like the texture of the ground. It's what what is the bottom of their shoe made out of? Exactly. It's so many things. Mm. So if it's like gravel or some kind of mud or some kind of pavement, you have to really consider the environment you're in. Yeah. Lisa, when you're doing stuff like that, do you find you tend to like, do you do a lot of Foley work or do you more just work off of sound libraries? I mainly just do the Foley. I'd rather have sounds mm. of my own I can just use, but I use the other stuff as references. So that way I've got an idea of what kind of sound I'm looking for. And in terms of the Foley, I always carry like this sock on top of it just so I'm muffling out some of the sound obviously it doesn't mm. work all the time but it muffles out most of the sound like a go. makeshift windbreaker yeah 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 I love that I'm gonna steal <laughs> that I'm gonna start putting a sock on all my microphones now do it it's really fun <laughs> I just love watching movies uh when I was young and then after that um I just think I love the feeling of like how the pictures and music like intertwine with each other and then after that uh, because I'm a vocalist and I'm a pianist uh, I was trained classically and then um, it's just not enough for me to just like play somebody else pieces I guess and then I just want to you know have a chance to work on my own uh, compositional stuff I guess and then uh, when I was in my college, my major is uh, musicology, and I have the opportunity to get to know the styles of each composers. So that kind of like motivated me to do further into like uh, film composing. And then um, after I graduated, I just sort of um, go to Eastman School of Music for my master's degree. And I, um, I just did... Um, uh, film scoring major there so that's how I like sort of grow my path into like what I'm doing right now so yeah I guess I'm I'm just interested because I don't do too much um like music recording or notation what softwares are you using um for me I do Cubase and Logic uh for my composing and for notation software I do Sibelius and mm. Mm, Dorico I guess yeah. I love Dorico. Um, yeah, it's, I think it's so good. It's yeah, I think so. It's I just incredible. It. I'm obsessed. Yeah, with <laughs> yeah. I've had experience with Sibelius in secondary school, so I'm pretty familiar mm -hmm. with that. 
Mm. Unless. I will say it's a bit tricky in terms of trying to get the exact sound in there because yeah, the instruments yeah. aren't good at quality, but you have to. I have to use it with a note performer to get it sound better. Do you want to take this question from the chat? Yeah, it's... let's go for it. Oh, it's cool. from Consuelo. It says, in terms of mixing sound rather than composing, are there specific settings the speakers follow when mixing? So I guess like mixing sound design versus um, music. Like, is there a difference in yeah in your playback system or the playback mindset? I'm just trying to think of this carefully. In terms of the mix and sound design, I will say that levels are very important. Mm -hmm. so you can't have anything too loud or too quiet so I'd when it comes to sound design I usually approach it putting everything on the same volume so that way it's all balanced because if you have everything I know people like it loud but later down the line you can have it loud during the mastering process during the mixing process you just have it level that's it and make sure when it comes to editing your sound that the EQ when you're EQing, that there isn't any type of muddy or airy sounds or any type of background noise. So when you're recording a sound, no noise, because once it's on the recording process during the mixing, you're not going to be able to have it level or it will sound horrible on your speakers. I'm not even going to lie to you because <laughs> I've had that experience and trust me, it was not fun. There was a lot of white noise. <laughs> fun times. I would just say... Yeah, as far as mixing to levels, I know, at least for UK broadcast television, it's, don't quote me, but I believe it's negative 23 decibels. Mm. And you get half a decibel on either side of that. But that's what it has to average out to, to be broadcast. Um, yeah. To meet broadcast specifications. I use, for that, there's a free loudness meter the one i use is called Ulean loudness meter it's just a free one and it will just run through the whole program and give you an average um loudness for the entire program it's always a matter of if you can just record things cleaner do yeah. it you know yeah. the whole fix it and post thing well i'm sure any like sound editor any editor anyone who does anything in post will say that that's just the bane of their existence <laughs> yeah i completely agree the bane of my existence because it takes so much it can mm -hmm. take so much longer to fix one line of dialogue in post if you yeah. could have just you know recorded it on set again waited till that plane passed by especially when you're out in environment terms as well so that's something to also consider yeah okay i have this film i worked on it was actually really interesting because the sound design and the music were so interweaved together, which is not always like this. Obviously, like usually it's easier when music can just like exist on its own. Obviously, there's always an interaction with sound design. But this was like so interweaved with mm. the dialogue and like it was coming in and out with like these motorcycle passing bys. And I don't know, one approach to to merging sound design and music and really. But I'd love to hear from the sound designers just like your thoughts on these interactions. Yeah, well, actually, I had a question for you listening to that, yeah, because sorry. so far in everything I've worked on, the music has come from either sound libraries or just buying a song flat out or just me composing something small. And I was wondering if you've ever if you ever work on things and like that, where your tracks dipping in and out, do you ever watch, listen to the final thing and go, oh, I really like that part of the song and it got dipped out. Do you have ever, I don't know, what's you, what's sort of your relationship with the mixer? Right. Yeah, I, I tend to have I'm, I've been thankful that I've had pretty good like relationships with my music editors and mixers that I've worked with. And like, I always understand that things, you know, for the final product, the final presentation of the film, it's like sometimes things have to go or be mixed really, really, really low or whatever. I always try to be super understanding because the nice thing is you have the full track. Like, like I, I think I, I remember I did a two minute version of this really cool orchestral thing and they ended up only using like 40 seconds. Mm. Um, and I was like, oh, dang. But the nice <laughs> thing is you have like that two minute version for you always, which is great. Um, and so I always try to think of just, yeah, the music also exists in other ways. Um, yeah. If it's a buyout contract though, and you can't do anything else with the tracks, then I guess it's a... It's a different story. Lisa, have you ever worked directly with a composer and had to go through that sort of process? 
Um, the only um, collaborations I've done was in university, so working with other students on different types of projects. So haven't really had the chance to work with actual composers. I'd love that opportunity, but working with people in university was really fun because that way I got different types of ideas from different types of music. And it was really interesting to see how different ideas from one particular image we were sent to compose to, to come up with different types of ideas of music because most of us went the classical route, but a different type of classical or a different mm -hmm. type of um, hy mixed hybrid. So I'd say in terms of that, it's really good opportunity to, to come out of your comfort zone. I mean, yes, you have your own projects, but also it's nice to exchange ideas and you, you just give and take, you know? Yeah, give and take. I think that's a big one. Yeah. Especially, the I mean, the bigger the project gets, the more opinions, you know, everyone, everyone sees the film a certain way. Mm. And there's the whole saying that, it's like there's the film that's written by the writer. There's the film that's the director sees and the film that the editor makes, you know, and it's yeah. in what's well, cool to tie this back to mixing, actually, which is very interesting is mm -hmm. that and uh, Ricky, you probably ex experienced this with your your writing. It's like mixing can be so important to people's perception of like what you're writing. I mean, sometimes literally like the same piece of music. I've done this. I've had this happen. I write a piece a cue for a film and they don't really like it but the way they're saying they don't like it it's more like there's certain elements and like through a couple rounds of translation I'm like I think if I mix this slightly differently you're gonna like mm. it so I'll yeah. like you know turn down the strings raise the piano it's like no change to the music but just mix it differently and I go yeah this is great um. yeah especially <laughs> yeah. you have to divide it into sections especially in films where they want mm. it into bits so director usually gives you your vision of where exactly it goes into and it is very specific so it takes a bit of a while and I guess like the different I guess for the sound design this is a good um and also Ricky if you like want to chime in I'm I'm just interested in how you all approach like presenting demos or presenting works in progress because um I always find also that like I'm I'm actually literally in this process where I'm, I'm finalizing this music for this film I'm working on. Um, it's a beautiful film. It's backed by BAFTA and other. It's great. Um, we're about to record, but we have to finalize the music. And so he now it's all the little details, which they're good details. I'm glad that my collaborator is bringing them up. Um, but it's like things about fades and like very subtle things that we might be doing in the music edit. Uh, but I'm always trying to just think of like, no, this this needs to be done by the time I deliver it. Like I can't do something later or whatnot. So I guess I'm just curious, like how do you all present demos or works in progress when you know you're going to record or you know that you're going to like work with a mixer down the road? Like what does that collaboration look like? Well, I think of, I kind of mind map it. So I divide it into different categories. So thinking first, looking at the picture. So once I got a visual in front of me, I think of like spotting things. So things like the cueing, what kind of instrument am I going to use to cue this? What kind of sound am I going to use to do that? So I look at the visual and use it as a pinpoint to where I want to go in terms of direction for each thing. Mm -hmm. That's my approach anyway. Same goes with the dialogue. So about like um, presenting demos, um, I think... For me and my boss, like, first of all, I think the director, <clears throat> like, they will have, like, a solid idea, like, what the music uh, they're looking forward to. Um, I think uh, every time I ask, like, uh, do you want it to just be just demo or do you want to be, like, live recorded? And they just have a solid idea, like, um, uh, for the strings, like, they want it, maybe they want it to be recorded and for the wood rings, maybe uh, depends on the budget. They will be like, um, we can just use a demo. And for the for details, if like um, they are looking forward to something like really big, like really orchestra, the rough mix could be really hard to, you know, sometimes it's hard to like satisfy them 
because it's really hard to like rough mix by our side. Mm, but after that, uh, if they, they say, oh, it's okay and you guys are doing a good job, we will just send um, send everything to like mixing engineer and to do other details. So it really depends on the directors and their requests. Mm -hmm. Yeah, from my experience. Yeah, yeah. I completely yeah. agree. Yeah, because I know that sometimes you have like a huge orchestral thing and to make to mock it up really, really good. It's like so yeah. much time. <laughs> yeah, it's like so much time. And like sometimes they're just like do the te like texting you thing. They just um, they're not like decided to like hi hire you yet. So it's like like too much time. It's like time consuming when you just do the orchestra and mix everything like up to that standard. So, yeah, it depends the process and the directors as well have any of you guys done sound for silent films no dialogue would you consider doing a silent film i've never done a silent film um i think it'd be really interesting and fun to do a silent film because if you think sort of classic silent film like charlie chaplin age silent film mm -hmm. it's it's music and maybe a couple of like diegetic sounds maybe yeah. But then, yeah, I mean, when you look at, if you call A Quiet Place a silent film, sort of, mm -hmm. almost like a modern day silent film, no dialogue, if that's what you're considering silent film. Yeah, no, I think that something like that would be really interesting because then you have to even focus even more and the footsteps are even more important. And yeah, what about you, Lisa? Um, so we've kind of done that in university. We did work with a silent type of film. It was quite an old one. I don't remember the name, but we worked with it. We were supposed to just put music on top of it. That's it. And not change the sound at all. So it was just making the music to go with the visual that's going on in the image. It was um, our te lecture. He said he wanted us to be free to explore different types of um, areas. was for a silent film that we were assigned just to not change the sound at all nothing to do with the sound just focus on the music specifically I love that I'm guessing the genre was suspense thriller yeah I'm curious to know was that the genre was that the genre of the original film so not originally so I the when I saw the visual at first it looked like it was a bit tense and he was mm. a bit mysterious so I went with that type of vibe so in terms of when he enters the shop, I decided to change it over. So you've got like mm. this hurrying, rushing to get to somewhere. And then when you go into the actual area, there's a bit of change. So the focus is on the strings and also his movement. So that mm. was my intention approach. What would you expect from the picture editor to do on the sound before passing it on to the sound department? And I think, I think that can vary a lot. Mm -hmm. I think it varies a lot, partially on budget. Um, Definitely. Like I know recently, recently I attended these talks and the editor from Star Wars Rogue One was there. Mm -hmm. And I was asking her about that. And she said anything under a million pounds budget. And she pretty much expects that as an editor, she's going to have to do all the sound. Yeah, it depends on how you picture the um, image. So you could have it, as I said, in different type of genres or different type of approaches doesn't have to be specifically horror it could be any type of genre as long as it fits but obviously you wouldn't have a disco on music on this one I mean yeah. it'd be interesting I but... mean you could it looks kind of 
60s 70s a bit yeah. <laughs> it is it is an interesting like sometimes the state that you get things and you have to kind of make do with whatever that state like you know I've worked on some stuff and, and you get and the sound is like all over the place which is fine like mm -hmm. things are in, prog in progress but I'll be working on like a quiet scene and then there's like someone who yells and it's like 20 decibels louder than everything else mm -hmm. in the whole <laughs> so I'll like what I'm writing sometimes I'll just I'll go in usually actually I do this a lot and I just like re-level stuff in the film mm -hmm. mix just so that like I have um a better understanding of what's going on so I don't have to like completely mute it but that is actually like it brings up an interesting point of like when you present like you're presenting music or sound design and you're including elements that have previously like are, are already in there so like when I'm sending a director a clip and it has the dialogue it has the picture it has the sound design but also I'm I'm mixing my music in so it's kind of like mm -hmm. you sometimes have to give it back a little better than you found it exactly because yeah. yeah. they're, they're not going to lie with directors they do tend to change things so it's not always going to be the same during the post-production it's always going to be different in terms of looking at the visual looking at where the music will be specifically mm. yeah well like I like you said yeah you might change a bit in the mix because mm. you know if I change this little bit in the mix and then send it to the director that's yeah. one less note that I might get it get back exactly you know? yeah for the picture editing stuff I think from my experience it's always going to be different like each version yeah like mm -hmm. for my boss and I we worked on like a movie uh, like featuring Jackie Jackie Chan mm -hmm. and then Ooh. and then the picture editing is just like before the picture log it was like a million versions and we have like um adapt our music to the picture like one by one because it's just a small change it's like makes the music like a different thing you know so because it's like a fighting stuff it's an action movie you yeah. have to like cut to the beat let the music have to match it um each move sort of so it's like it's fun but it's really miserable <laughs> we just hope <laughs> they can just give me the picture like the locked picture but they have their own ideas so the directors want um uh, want their products like in a different way each time so <laughs> yeah, yeah that's, that, i mean that's really interesting because normally when you think of like sound design and music usually you aren't brought in until picture lock is picture yeah. is locked in <laughs> So then you avoid all these one little one little things cut shorter. So now I have to Yeah, you know, I have to shift things. things around, you know. <laughs> but I guess again it's probably like a bit of a budget thing. If they have the budget yeah. to have you doing new cuts for every yeah. picture edit. Oh, of course. Then yeah. they're gonna do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna do it. <laughs> so Riki, yeah. you're probably a pro at conforming. <laughs> <laughs> probably like <laughs> Yeah, I have to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's crazy. Got more professional experience in that type of field than we do in terms of the scoring. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I can imagine. Though. I mean, it's especially with the feature. Like I'm doing this short. I'm doing. It was a lot of like back to back, just like different. Literally every day, I was getting a new cut, um, mm. which, <laughs> which is fine. I mean, it's like twenty minute film. Like it's it was okay, and he was really cool about it. Like so, the collaboration was totally fine. But it was just, it was a thing. Like, it was a thing we had to to work through. We ended up chopping five minutes, which if you, you know how directors, it's like so hard to cut stuff. Like, yeah. he chopped five minutes from a 20-minute film into like a 15-minute film, which was wow. really incredible. Yeah. It was, yeah. It was so, <laughs> total, total so like, okay, I can, I can push, move my music around. It's much easier than the kind of decisions he had to make. Yeah. Um, I mean, as long as you're not doing the whole thing all over again. It's, yeah much yeah. easier <laughs> right. yeah right um we have yeah. a songwriting question whether we've been asked to like write or work with a song in a film i actually do have a songwriting story but if anyone else has one feel free to feel free to share maybe okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. okay so on the same film actually from the clip that i shared earlier there was a song at the beginning which i don't have loaded up um 
but the the third cue the last the third cue um it's pretty much this like this girl and she's listening to a song like she's listening to a song on her way to school and this song and like the sound of this song take you through like the whole film um and everything that's going on um also in the scene i shared um yeah and one quick note on like foreign languages i know sorry we, we weren't able to understand the the action really but it is actually a very good reminder for us when we're thinking sound and mixing that sometimes like when the film is in a different language we sometimes take dialogue and lower the priority like i think it's just something we do in our mind so it's just a good reminder of like regardless of the language always being really sensitive to dialogue and like not letting a different language stop us from scoring in relation to the dialogue um but anyway so we there was a song super important for the film and I worked with uh, the songwriter, this, the director's friend, and, and she was she was wonderful. But it took us a while to figure out like exactly what the song needed to be. Because at the end of the day, even though there was only like 30 seconds of the song in there, we said we need to make a pop song. We need to make the whole pop song start to finish. We need to have it like fully produced. Like we need to make a pop song. It's, so it's interesting because it takes, you're in a different mindset than you're like scoring the scene. It's like you're scoring the scene but through a preliminary step um so that was just like an interesting process thing um and there were these layered vocals that took us a while to really figure out and you'll hear them in the end credits scene we bring them back a little bit um and then bring in like all these cool sound design i think sound designers will also appreciate this um this cue because there's a lot of sound design elements but working with a songwriter was like it was really fun i mean but it's just such a different mindset because you need to like get their voice you need to get their lyrical ideas like you are a song producer who has to be aware of what's happening with the film I almost felt like more like a music supervisor than a composer because it's like you're producing but with a music supervisor mindset yeah I was, I was gonna say about like I think it's what, interesting what you say about foreign language because I think there is I think foreign language films are becoming extremely popular and especially when like doing dialogue editing dialogue editing something in foreign language and making sure you know you're like oh that sound there's a bit of a click on the end of that so I'm gonna de-click it and then you realize you've taken off the end of a word and now it doesn't make and just always being aware of that because it, it can get really tricky and yeah I don't know if you've had any experience with that Lisa of trying to design well, something foreign language well when it comes to we have experimented with different type of um cultural stuff around the mm. world so thinking of, but that was in terms of the game side so we was set uh, this adventure game that was kind of in a type of arabian desert so thinking about the sounds that arabian time trying to capture mm. that type of cultural sound is very yeah. important it creates almost like a research element exactly that's the, the role part. That's the, that is the fun part. I, I love the research in different instruments. So this kind of thing to me is just, you want me to research? Fine, I'm doing it. <laughs> yeah. This is this is a challenge for a composer just to get outside the comfort zone because I don't like staying in one particular place. I don't know about you guys. Mm. It is nice to get, yeah. Mm. And finding like the authentic way, mm. like the a way that, so you'd like that. So um, that last kind of flute thing and that cue you just heard. Yeah, the flute sound that... <laughs> I like yeah. that. Like it, it's a ne flute, um, traditional like Arabic instrument, but mixed with like a synth and a mm. other, yeah, like I sample. Yeah, I a synth in that. And so yeah, so it's like all. So, like, so would you like, say it's kind of like a mixed hybrid sort of thing? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, but it still has this like. It's nice because I have this this legit like bass. Like we recorded the ne player. He's incredible, and it was like just cool to get that like authentic approach in there. I think mm. that's always something really yeah. interesting. Like <laughs> the amount of times I hear the Duke as like, this is the Middle Eastern <laughs> instrument <laughs> always <laughs> pains me a little bit because there's so much more. Um, and the Duke's actually Armenian. It's not even like uh, Middle Eastern. So, but it's, yeah, but it was, yeah. So there's, there's all sorts of beauty. So I love that, that you're into research like Lisa has anyone done sound design or composing for animated projects yes I have yeah we love animations <laughs> Ricky have you done animation yeah uh for animated stuff 
uh, sometimes it's like orchestral stuff, but sometimes it's like experimental. You have to like evolve something electronic, like mix with orchestral. That's pretty fun, I guess. And then that's when I have to like dig more into like sound design stuff. Uh, I think I'm not that good at the sound design. I'm not only like a composer, but I try to like uh, evolve something interesting into my composition. The whole process is really fun and both a learning process for me. Animation is such a like, what's the word? Animation is such a, it's like a different, it's like a cousin of film. I always feel like it is mm. film obviously, but it's like the rules are so, they're so different. Um, and Agreed. you never especially, get to finish them. Yeah. Especially in Disney and Pixel. I'll tell you that now. Do you want to elaborate on that or is that? Um, so <laughs> we got set this project in university mm. to work on Buzz Lightyear. So we were told okay. to compose something in, in his image. So as you know, Buzz Lightyear is a fearless, courageous type of guy. So I tried to create that type of personality in the music. In approach to that, it was thinking of how to get into that type of Disney-like feel. I was trying to think of different ways of how to approach it. And I will say it was a frustrating process, but the end result was worth it. Because I had to think about space and what I thought about space. I thought about synthesizers, mm. classical, classical instruments, that kind of thing. I don't have any examples of animation. I can show the clip I have. It's on my website. Um, my my website isn't the most fleshed out thing in the world. But I always think it's better to just have some simple, mm. like even if it's just one page with examples so of your work, it's so much better than having nothing to send to someone. So important. It's so it's important. Like yeah. The most important thing ever. <laughs> Especially like job applications. It says like optional, like website link. And it just it just puts you just slightly farther ahead. But yeah. You too. Just missed it. We both did. So in the spring, you are planting bedding plants and the like, and trimming back on the roses so that when you're out in the garden during the summer, you can get the benefit of it all. It's a more of a case of just um, being able to unwind, taking it easy. Yeah, I like that a lot. Did you do the ADR and the music for this or? For the, which one? The project you just showed. The last one? Yeah. No, that one, there's no ADR for that one. It was just okay. dialogue cleanup. The one at the bus stop, mm. that one, like it was all filmed and it was so loud. And there was like the traffic was so bad and it turned into recording ADR for the entire film basically. Oh. And sort of using ADR camera audio, which is, you shouldn't, <laughs> I would recommend not ever doing ever. And then um, I used this plugin package called Isotope. Love and just it. using like I love, I love that isotope. Plug yeah, I love that plugin. Oh, yeah. <laughs> isotope and um there's one called Supertone Clear, which is re really lovely. And I just basically ran the all the dialogue through Supertone Clear. And it gets it gets it like halfway there, and then just mm -hmm. using like sound design and ambience to like distract <laughs> sort wow. of. But yeah. 
Oh, it's awesome. Yeah, it's cool. Yeah, the bus scene, like it just I was watching him like this is they're just at the bus stop. Like, the footstop, is... the footsteps. Yeah, all, I was like, this is it felt all very put in natural. after. Yeah. yeah. I didn't think anything of it. And then you <laughs> well, yeah, and labored like, over the scene for hours. And... <laughs> the wide shots and everything. Because you only have one chance to get a bus coming by to chase mm. after a London bus before they get pissed off at you. And so, you know, we're behind the camera yelling, run, run, run. <laughs> and then you have to, you can't use any of the audios. <laughs> yeah. Thank you to all of you. This has been such a fascinating, wide ranging, really generous, really um, lovely, lovely talk. And it's been a pleasure to have you all. So on behalf of everyone here, um, may I give you our great thanks.